Barcelona Podcast, episode 173, and this little opinion is brought to you by the most influential voices in the SC Barcelona community. Hi, I'm Dan Hilton, he's Frances Tomas, and it may be a new year. Happy 2020, all you kool but the same old Barcelona, isn't it, Frances? It seems to be the same. Um, unfortunately, we still have Alberde as a coach. Unfortunately, the board is still sort of run by the same people. Um, hopefully, we don't have many more months or in, you know, I think it's going to be years until this is changed. But um, we've got a whole decade ahead of us. Let's, let's be optimistic and hopefully pray for some changes. Well, while Barcelona has started the decade on the wrong foot, we'll say, here at the Barcelona podcast, I just want to lift up the hood just for a second here. This is our very first show on Blue Wire Network. And while you won't hear the ads this week, usually... Uh, again, this is just for all you listeners who've been with us. You've noticed that we had ads at the beginning and end of our show. It wasn't my voice, but now with our move to Blue Wire Network, you're going to be hearing some live ad reads. Not this week, but in the forthcoming weeks. And we also have some big, not changes, but additions and improvements to be made to the YouTube channel, to the website, barsablog.com, where you find a lot more content there. Also, if you're using the One Football app, you can find all of our articles and you can watch either the YouTube videos and find the podcast on the One Football app as well. So a lot of different moving parts going on, a lot of exciting things for the Barcelona podcast. And I think a good way to give back, Frances, is it's been a few weeks since we had a listener show. So I guess that's what we're going to be doing today, right? Let's have a listener show. We love our listeners. Um, They are very active on the Facebook group, and that's where we get the questions from. So, yeah, let's do it. Can't wait to start. So here we go. For La Ronda, our very first question, who should Barcelona buy, sell, and loan this winter? And, Frances, we're going to do a truncated version of this question. While we could go dive in deep on some of the transfer targets and all these things, I think we're just going to do a broad stroke, a quick brush over, because we have a lot of listener questions. So, as far as Barcelona buying, selling, and loaning this winter, I actually want to pose to you the answer that I don't really think they should necessarily buy anyone. As much as it seems like somebody needs to be bought, I don't think buying is the right idea. However, with Carlos Alenia already to Real Betis, he made his debut against Alaves, and uh, we've heard about Tadibo as well being another guy that could be on the move. I just think Barcelona have to mitigate the number of players they sell. And obviously, Arturo Vidal has been the major headline story about whether or not he's going to go to Inter Milan. And every day you hear something new. You hear that he's going to be staying. He's going to be leaving. He's suing the club. And really, it's uh, the transfer saga here in the January window involves Arturo Vidal and exodus from the club, not necessarily entering the club. Yeah, I mean, in terms of buy-in, I agree with you. In terms of buy-in, I think... Unless you can gather some money and go for Mbappé, I don't think anyone else is really worth it. I know that we've been talking about Neymar for many years, but um, at the price that they're asking, and, and you know, both of these players are from PSG, who are definitely not a selling club. So beyond that, I don't really think that we've got any solutions anywhere else but where we are today, especially when you're now in January. Um, Arturo Vidal, obviously scored um, over the weekend uh, against Espanyol in the Catalan Derby, which is, which is good. But, um, you know, there's also been news about him claiming 2.4 million euros from Barca while playing for Barca, which to me is absolutely nonsensical. Um, I don't think that makes any sense whatsoever, especially guys that seem to be right. Um, and uh, that's what the La Liga directors have been saying from, you know, from the, from the offices in Madrid. They've actually taken his complaint away, but I think that it all comes back to, to, to this board. I mean, the club is just accepting some nonsensical stuff, left, right and centre. Um, you know, the value is going down the drain because, you know, chasing Griezmann after he did what he used to do, uh, being sued by Neymar and then still saying, well, you know, if we get you back, then can, can you drop this claim you've got against us in the, you know, in the courts? Then Arturo Vidal being one of our players doing this is just, you know... I tend to refer it as popcorn. It's just, you just put some corn and you put the heating on and then the whole popcorn goes all sorts of places and uh, you can't really control it. That seems to be what the institution is at this moment in time. I mean, luckily, results are not being horrendous in terms of, especially in La Liga. And we are we are going to the next round in the Champions League and, you know, see what happens there um, when we play the Italians. But institutionally, it's just becoming in a way unrecognizable and ultimately a joke. Well, I would also say, too, with the January window and the transfers, as as always is the case, take everything with a grain of salt, but the Arturo Vidal 
situation, as you mentioned, seems to be very real. Uh, and it is definitely uh, something that the club shouldn't be necessarily happy about. Uh, and it's not a good look for the club either. Now, when it comes to some of the other rumors that you've heard, I think there is actually a lack of rumors for this January window, which is a good thing. I, I think the club, not that they should be standing pat, but I think the business to be done over the summer could be a good vision. Uh, the big news that's coming out as far as like the transfers, and this could have to do with different and ex contract extensions for these players. So this might even be agent driven though. Ricardo Pereira, the 26 year old right back at Leicester city was rumored. He's valued at 50 million euros, which is puzzling. He also has a contract at Leicester for till 2023. So again, that isn't necessarily him. Maybe just looking for a wage raise. And that's why his agent's trying to link him with Barcelona and Lucas Klosterman, the right back from RB Leipzig in Germany. They're currently leading. However, in the Bundesliga, a 23 year old, but he's also, both those guys are pretty tall for right back and they would be coming in to replace Nelson Semedo in the summer. So this is even a long-term solution. What's so puzzling about that is that Barcelona have a buy or purchase option over the summer for Emerson, who for Real Betis has scored three goals and four assists. He's been one of the best right backs in all the league, and he's only 21. So for Barcelona to get that player much cheaper and a player that still has, I'd say, a a lot more room to grow than 26-year-old Pereira or Klosterman, that's a puzzling rumor to me, and I'm hoping that the deal is just... Uh, for Barcelona, they should already be tracking out, and January should be used to lay down the groundwork for what the summer should be. Now, of course, paying for Neymar in the summer means almost none of the other deals are possible. We, you know, we don't need to go ahead. We have that again. But for me, almost a perfect summer would be Latoro Martinez coming from Inter Milan. I mean, uh, yes, for 13 goals, 30, three assists already, so he's a buy in the summer. We know that Pedri is on his way from. Las Palmas, and I think he's been so good for Las Palmas this year that whether or not he's in the B team, I think he's going to be one of those guys that should be in between. I think he's good enough to make first team appearances a few next year, not necessarily be a a consistent contributor, but I think he's on his way certainly next season to be a contributor at what he'll be, he'll be 18 in uh, next November. And then the final piece of that puzzle, I think once you've added Latoro Martinez and Emerson, I think the only deal really it should be done here in January uh, is Danny Olmo from, and we're going to have questions about him later. So we'll talk about him as a player, but Danny Olmo from Dinamo Zagreb, eight goals, seven assists already. And yes, obviously he's playing in Croatia, but he is in the Champions League as well, where he's put up some stats. He has had some good games against Shakhtar Donetsk and Man City, just to name a few. I think they should buy Danny Olmo now from Zagreb because he wants to come, because he wants to play at a higher profile club than Zagreb to get a spot at the Euro 2020 with Spain. So you buy him now, and if he, it doesn't seem like Ernesto Alverde is going to use him or have him contribute, which it doesn't seem like he uses attacking, young attacking midfielders very often, that being Valverde, then you loan him to a, a top five league club right away for the betterment of the player. So you buy him for the 30 to 40 million, which I not only do I think he's worth, but I think it's actually a good deal for a player like him of what he's already shown. And then you loan him immediately out to, now obviously not a team like Napoli because they're playing against you in the Champions League, but uh, along that ilk, you find a club that suits him, whether it's maybe in the Premier League even, maybe a, a Watford that are looking for some kind of attacking midfield, uh, midfielder in the Premier League or what have you. Anyway, so Danny Olmo for me, Coupled with Emerson at right back, if they're going to sell Nelson Semedo and Latoro Martinez to replace a number nine. This is no offense to Neymar, but he's going to cost everything in the kitchen sink. So why not just begin your business now of what you're going to do in the summer, fortify in the summer, and just survive and get a A plus for that transfer window. So that starts in January because, as we say, Frances, what, 98% of January deals aren't really great deals? Uh, apart from Prince Boateng, which which obviously has been a oh, world class star course. for yeah, us and uh, right. made that club so much better. <laughs> um, we cannot forget the legend there. Um, yeah, don't cannot really disagree with much of what you're saying in terms of buy-in, but um, as I tend to say pretty much every week, it's I don't think that unless you're going to buy a starter, which out of the ones you mentioned, Lautaro would be, Mbappé would be, I think Neymar would be as well. I don't think any of the others you mentioned would be a starter at all. So I don't think that that's the model of club we should be going for. We should be going for internal promotion in terms of uh, promoting Ricky Puch. And, you know, you're not going to get, if, say, they end up selling Semedo, which who I don't think should be sold at all because he's definitely, with Sergio Roberto, that position is covered to a good to a good to great standard. Uh, obviously, it's not Danny Alves' standard. He's not even Jordi Alba's standard. But um, I think it's, it's more than decent. Um, and I don't think that's an, er- an area that we should reinforce and invest heavily on. And, you know, I think Danny Olmo and the other ones you've mentioned, they, they wouldn't be starters. So for me, they should basically just stay where they are. 
um, and people from, from La Masia be promoted. Now, another point where I'm saying, especially about Olmo, um, Carla Salaña had a clause to leave in terms of not leaving the club, but go on, on loan um, and once con- wanted to and was convinced against it by Valverde in the summer. I'm saying, you know, you're going to be trusted, you know, things are changing. I know you have a season at Barca B last year. You're going to be really important. And then we all know what happened. He played half a game in Bilbao and then disappeared for what seemed like an eternity. I don't know if it was 10 or 15 weeks, something like that, something stupid like that. And then once the transfer window for now started coming up, then he started featuring again as if it was a miracle. And, um, you know, the, the, co- the close is unilateral meaning that Alanya could just decide with no impediments to just leave the club. And uh, he's fought very hard and sort of ignored everyone in the club in terms of, um, you know, the board, but especially Valverde's promises and said, no, actually, I'm going to go to Betis. Uh, I know that Mar Bartra is very happy there. I know that Cristian Tello is really happy there, featuring pretty much in every game. And, and as we say in Spanish, matándola, ki- killing it. And that's what I want for my career. Um, I, if I was Dani Olmo, with Valverde as a manager, I wouldn't come back to Barca. I would just stay where I am or I would go into a sort of next tier club, um, any of the premiership clubs, maybe someone like, I don't know, uh, Juventus or Inter or something something along those lines. Maybe Juventus a bit higher, but you know what I mean? And just continue to develop because honestly, I think if Danny Olvo, as, as great as he's been uh, for Dynamo so far, he would not be a starter for us. He would find himself behind, you know, 97-year-old Rakitic, uh, who we have seen that even though he's been influential, don't you know, don't want to be too ungrateful here, but he just cannot give what a team that is aspiring to win the Champions League can give. And uh, Arturo Vidal, yes, of course, he's scoring here and there, but you know, this is six goals, which for a midfielder at Barca is a lot. But in the larger scheme of things. I don't think he contributes enough in terms of build-up, in terms of control of the games. Um, sure, the guy is aggressive. Sure, the guy can run into spaces and score goals here and there. But I don't think that's what a Barca midfield should be. Um, if if you want to use him as he has been used as a last 20, 30 minute weapon, then fair enough. But we need to find someone who can start at the midfield. And I'm not saying Daniel could not be a starter. The same way I'm not saying Alanya could not be a starter. But I don't think that either one of those will be trusted by our current manager, which is why it's pretty obvious where the changes need to be. Yeah, it's it's odd. I think we agree and disagree. And we uh, this is actually perfect. We're in a transition to some listener questions here. But Papa and Pacho... Pancho both asked about Danny Allman, whether or not, what are his chances of signing, and then what are the chances that he would, or how would he fare in the team? And I think you, where I do agree with you is that Valverde would not use him uh, in the way that he probably should be used and what is best for his development. Uh, he can play as both a winger and as a central midfielder, and both of those spots he could possibly reinforce and help Barca. Um, but all that said, uh, I, I think you're, again, correct under the point that Almo wouldn't be a good piece of business for Barca because he would wind up being a wasted talent again. But just because that's the case doesn't mean that he shouldn't... The the club and the board should not have the understanding and the forward thinking to know that in the next two to three seasons, he's going to be a player that they're going to feel like they miss out on. Uh, And yes, he could go to another club, but then you buy him after that, sure. But the other thing I would say, too, is about promoting from within. That's the big worry here. Right, that that Tadebo goes, and there's, apparently he's going to be swapped with Alessio uh, Romagnoli, who's a left-footed center back for AC Milan, but also their captain. So again, let's shoot that rumor to the to the sun. Now Tadebo could be going to AC Milan, and then there's no backup brought in. Maybe Ronald Araujo, who Ernesto already has proved to like, would be the idea there. And the same thing, if Vidal winds up leaving in January, and you already sent Carlos Alenia out, and you're not going to buy anybody new then where are you going to find another midfielder? Then it's, oh, Rakitic is going to be, uh, it's what, Sergio Busquets and Rakitic is going to play every 90 minutes and De Jong, who's even serving a red card suspension now for the next one. So who's going to start in his place? The answer would be Ricky Pooh, sure, great. But Verde has not shown that he's going to be using the Barca B players and the La Masia players either. So what is it going to be? Is it going to be another yep. Prince Boateng or Murillo? kind of stopgap loan for a player that is secondary? Because you're right, they need to bring in a starter. That's what they would like to see. In the same regard, I think Danny Olmo would have just as likely a, a place to start uh, if you're not bringing up Ricky Pooch. Then I say just go out and, and get the business for a player that you would trust a little more. But uh, as far as a center midfielder who's going to come in and start right away on in the January transfer window market, that's just not a thing. 
You know, you don't, you're not going to get a starting center midfielder for less than $120 million. And I haven't even heard many that, uh, apparently today, Harry Winks for Tottenham is a guy that they're talking about. And yes, he plays for Tottenham, but he's a player that, you know, is being rumored for 80 to $100 million around there for other clubs. So that's what you get in January. You get inf- in inflated purchases. And uh, yeah, you even think about this window about Mark Kukurea, not to bring him back, but just to check in and recognize that he's another player on loan that Barca has that is uh, one of, of Hadafe's best players. And they've been a top half level team this season in the Liga. So just keep an eye on him and, and remember that he's another player that Barca could, in theory, be bringing back that could reinforce their squad when, in theory, a new coach is brought in to get a little younger. So I do want to go on the Valverde point, though, here, Frances. Stick with that uh, and speak about Juan's question. Can the board tell Valverde what lineup to play like it happens in American sports? Which that is... I disagree with that a little bit because with owner meddling, I think those are the worst kind of teams in the U.S. that have that, where they have an owner or a president that that are taking a little bit too much license into the lineups. But the question being, does the, Frances, for you, the question, does the board or uh, Abidal or certain people, other than giving and taking away players, can the board or any of those officials force Valverde's hand into who he plays? Well, can they? Yes course they can i mean they 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 are running the club so they can do whatever they want should they absolutely not because they are not um the experts because they're not the ones running the sporting side of things which obviously should be should be the manager um are they no idea because you know we don't know what goes on behind closed doors and if i was the manager and i was in charge of us and they would tell me what to do i would walk out so i think and actually that's the answer um i don't think there's much more to say no, I mean, I think the pressure is back up on Valverde. It seemed like it had gone down a bit, but questions from both Charlie Barca, hey Charlie, and Ted, why was Antoine Griezmann against Espanyol removed for Semedo instead of Suarez coming off for Semedo? And not only that, but Charlie makes the point that, yes, and then Charlie says he thinks that Pep would have done it. We're not sure, but the idea would have been for, a, we'll say, a prototypical Barca manager to not to take off Suarez in that moment for Espanyol when even when they were down a player but up a goal and put Ansu Fati on and continue to put Espanyol on the back foot. That was the Barca ideal, but instead it was fighting for a 2-1 victory that wound up not happening. And the guy who was tirelessly working in Griezmann with all that energy winds up coming off against Espanyol. Can you think of strategically any way to uh, give the green light to why Valverde would have done that? No, there's, there's no way. I think um, 99.999% of the millions of people watching that game would have known that the, what the game needed is someone who can be mobile up front. You know, I think that... Um, either leaving Griezmann for longer or what you just said, just bring in either, it doesn't have to be Ansu Fati. Uh, I think Carlos Pérez would have been a good choice as well. Yeah, either I player agree. that would have upset something up front, someone who would have challenged, someone who would have run at defenders. And uh, Suarez just, just uh, definitely after 70, 80 minutes of play, he just cannot do that anymore. And um, But the thing is, I think Valverde is playing the long game and also there's a shade of po- political sort of strategies going on because say say you take say you don't take Suarez out then you've kept him happy haven't you and also um, I was reading the the FC Barcelona social media earlier on today and Suarez has been involved in all the last 10 games um, sorry all the last 10 goals that Barca have scored I think it's in La Liga I mean you can go through the Barca social media looking for that the official one I think this is playing the political game because the, the game clearly anyone who's played football or anyone who's anyone who's watched football for more than ten minutes understands that when you're playing against ten men, you've got the upper hand, and when you've got the upper hand in the later part of the game, you need to be mobile, you need to run at people. And uh, Valverde, for whatever reason, decided not to do it, and unfortunately, the reason seems to be political. Yeah, and with Suarez, it, we've talked about this many times over the course of this season, and we're going to do it in the last, in the next six months as well. But for Suarez, he's been involved in all those goals. And the question that I continue to ask is, if Griezmann was playing in that nine role, which again isn't completely natural for him, Suarez has proven to have still a lot to give. But if Griezmann is in those positions, does Barca, not only do they score the same number of goals, but do they score more goals? 
And it's the same, it's the same question with Ling Lei as a center back. And I, I've been critical of Ling Lei this season. He has not been as good he was, as he was last year. And if TT is in that position, or even if Tadebo had been in Gerard Piquet's position for what a third of those or a fourth of those starts, would Tadebo have put in the same performance? Because he was fantastic against Inter Milan. And Sammy Utiti, I think, has been just as good as Ling Lei when he's seen the field, the field this year, and he's been a little healthier. He's just kind of waiting on the bench. So it, it's not a knock on the players that are on the field because they are you know, helping Barca lead La Liga, uh, tied on points with Real Madrid. They won their Champions League group, and they did the right things. But we're watching what's playing, and I mean, we're watching what's happening on the field. And as Antonio asks, how can we as Barca fans see our team moving forward to win any trophies this season with our last few displays? And do you think we can beat Atletico Madrid in the Super Cup and the uh, Spanish Super Cup? Well, uh, that, I mean, that's a twofold question. We'll, we'll answer number one first. In that, Barca clearly the way they're playing and the way they played against Espanyol and the way they've continued to go out with the same kind of almost getting over the line, just getting the victories or having to do something great through the individual magic of Suarez or, or Messi, uh, or we've seen Dembele, obviously, when he was when he was healthy, just individual moments. And yet this Barcelona team doesn't be able to seem to be able to create that distance between them and an opponent. And the, the answer, again, to me is... It's clearly that the players on the field are good enough because they're world-class players. They've been world-class players. They're legends of the game. But would another player be doing just as well in those positions and in those circumstances? It's a hypothetical, obviously, and impossible to answer. But that seems to be the biggest issue with Valverde. It's not necessarily the team that he's picking because those are great players. But it's that other players, I think there's really a growing belief in a fan base. And you see this, this is when managers leave. This is when there are issues between a, a fan base and a, and a manager. And we continue to have issues with Valverde because you wonder, why is there guys on the bench that you think could, could do the same job or a better job? Yeah, um, I'm not going to add much more with that. Just to say that there was a um, survey in sports, which is obviously the biggest Catalan newspaper, together with Mundo Deportivo, but sport is, is bigger. And 80% of voters, and these are culés, you know, they're not just, it's a Marca, who is a sort of whole of Spain, obviously Madrid bias, a bit of media. This is a Catalan media outlet doing a survey. 80% of people who voted wanted Valverde out now. And 80% is a really, really large number. And then yeah. I'm, I'm not going to go into question one, because you obviously answered it. Question two, Supercopa not interested at all okay um, <laughs> i know that the format has changed i know that they're playing with our neighbors here i'm in qatar obviously so they're in saudi arabia i i'm not interested you know i really am not I, i'm sure that the media who obviously have paid a lot of money for for this competition to be aired and, and obviously to be hosted in, in saudi it's uh, it's the super copa it does not matter okay it, it probably will be sold as a you know, clash of the titans, Madrid, Valencia, Atletico Madrid, Barcelona, all involved, blah, blah, blah. It's the Super Cup. No one cares, all right? If fans want to go crazy over a game against Atletico Madrid, that means nothing, then, then so, so be it. But ultimately, in the larger scheme of things, it means absolutely nothing. It has never meant anything. I know the Spanish Federation are trying to revamp it. They changed the dates. They put it now. Um, and they're trying to sort of give it all the glamour, etc. But it's the Super Cup. It's not important. Yeah, I mean, I would say the most important thing about the Spanish Super Cup for our listeners is actually to head over to the YouTube channel because you'll already find up there a history of the Spanish Super Cup. Uh, and the answer is that clubs tend to care about it with the lineups they put out. But in the same way in Spain, it is clearly... Uh, the trophy that is number four in everybody's trophy cabinet. And that's an, and arguably, if the Spanish team wins the Champions League the first year, then the FIFA Club World Cup is seen as, as more important than even the Spanish Super Cup. So head over to the YouTube channel, watch the video, and maybe watch the video and not even watch the matches. You're right, Frances. That's how little the Spanish Super Cup does matter. But so it's, it's got an, a little bit of an interesting history of the Spanish Super Cup. But other than that, you're absolutely right. I don't like the trip to Saudi Arabia. Why is a competition? Competition that is contested with just Spanish teams happening uh, somewhere else. Well, the answer, I I'm just going to leave it with money. That's what it comes down to. Why are there now four different teams instead of just the La Liga winners and the Copa del Rey winners? And obviously, when those are the same, that you have the, the tie breaks and all that. But why is it just four teams now instead of two? Well, money is the answer to that. So before we get a little too cynical about the Spanish Super Cup, let's head on to a another question coming from Cole. 
We are at the midway point in the season. Who would you two have starting the Champions League final tomorrow against Liverpool? Cole, I'll start by saying we have to get there first. But the I guess yes. the, the question <laughs> the question would be for France, uh, Frances would be I don't know. I mean, for me, it's almost two different players. Who would I have starting, and who would Val- who is Valverde going to start? Are the two? I mean, does it really matter who I think is going to start, or who I think Valverde would put on the field? Well, we can answer both. I mean, personally, I would start Ter Stegen. Then I would have Sergio Roberto and Jordi Alba, Piqué and Lenglet in the middle. Um, obviously, now now that Alain has gone, I would have to go for Busquets as a holding. I would have Frankie. Um, I would have Arthur. Obviously. He's not, not Arthur, Artur, that's his name. Mm-hmm. Um, even though that the spelling is a TH in English, it's Artur. Um, obviously, he's not healthy, but he will be my starter there. And then up front, for a game that important, I will have Suarez as the striker. I will have Messi, and I will have Dembele on the other side. But obviously, some of the people that I mentioned are not healthy. And in terms of um, Suarez, he wouldn't be able to play the 90 minutes. So on the 60th, he comes off, Griezmann comes in. Yeah, I actually... You then, know- I actually agree with that. Um, I know you have your, your midfield to go, but I agree with that front three. I'm going to jump in there that I think against a team like Liverpool and against these top level opponents, they will destroy you if you do not use width. And that's going to, I think, going to be the biggest problem moving forward in against tougher competition, even like against Napoli in, in the next round of the Champions League, if they do not use width properly. And we do speak about Dembele because he's been in those situations and you can go back and say, oh, he missed that. What could have been the deciding goal against Liverpool? But you know what? As I said, that night against Liverpool, they would have scored five. So I, again, I don't put that on Dembele, even though it always comes up and we remember it. But against Liverpool again, I think Dembele is the player to add width. Uh, and if Dembele is injured, then you know what? I, you, as I've said, the managers for Barcelona that do the best are the ones that are brave. That is historically how it works. So if that were the case, I agree with Frances. I think Luis Suarez would be the starter next to Messi. But you get brave and you start Ansu Fati then if it's not Dembele. And you add width against those best teams because that's what you have to do. And then, again, with the back line, I would just change up Umtiti against Lenglet because, again, I think Lenglet is just, he just doesn't have the pace and PK is in top form. If PK is out of form, then obviously put him on the bench. But no, I think Lenglet has just not had his best this year. And I would put Umtiti for his pace in his position. And then I agree. Roberto on the one side, who always plays well against big opponents. Jordi Alba on the other side. And I guess Mark andre Ter Stegen in goal. But yeah, let's let's hash out that midfield then. You said you wanted De Jong, Busquets, and Arter. I, I can't see I can disagree much, Frances. No, no, no. I think that if everyone's healthy, that has to be the three. At this moment yeah. in time, with Alanya gone. And, and my worry is, I mean, Arturo Vidal comes on and starts, but I was thinking, uh, as a question from Arturo comes, what was the main factor behind Barca not getting a win against Espanyol? Well, I, I think the answer to that is that when two of the better players on the field are Luis Suarez and Arturo Vidal, they're the ones who play best against that kind of derby where teams don't want to play. And it, it does create kind of an answer to me that against Espanyol, who didn't really want to play in that match, Right? They had, at one point in the first half, they had 17% possession. They were just going to try to get a counter-attacking goal. They were going to be hacking everybody, fouling everyone. That's what a Derby Barcelona is. In the same regard, the Barcelona B team, who I watched that day, with Puj and Callado, those two were very good in that match as well. They were, and Alvaro Ruiz actually got a, a rare start and played well uh, in that match, because they were working harder, and they were forcing Espanyol B to play. They were making them play football. And they wound up winning 2 nothing. Ronald Araujo was good in that game as well. Uh, basically a counterbalance to what PK was against Espanyol. I thought he was decent in the first half, at least, against Espanyol. But, es- but Barcelona's first team, as much as Espanyol had a great defensive shape, sure, uh, credit to Abelardo, they did not pull them out. And they did not have any width. And they did not force them to play football. That being Espanyol. They just let it be a rugby match. And when Barca are willing to do that, then if Arturo Vidal and Suarez and the other guys that are going to punch you in the mouth, if they're not the ones who win those kind of matches, then Barcelona aren't going to get a result. And so that was my main factor against Espanyol was that it seemed like Espanyol wanted it more than Barca. And Barca's, when Messi doesn't have his magic on a day and when things just aren't vibing and working out, then yeah, you want the Chilean and Luis Suarez to get you a result. And I think that winds up being a huge, huge problem for the team. Yeah, and... Um... It, it, you said it there. I think mean, it looked like Espanol wanted it more because they actually did want it more. And, and it comes down to that. And when you've got a manager who's not able to motivate the players, and, you know, I have seen people saying, oh, but the players should be able to motivate themselves. I, I'm sorry, but I, I, I do get the element of that. And, and you should be a professional. But when you're playing, what is it, 50 matches a game, 50 matches a season, it's hard to keep track 
of your own motivation and it's hard to sort of get yourself geared up and that's why the managers are there i mean if we if you're going to put everything on the players being sort of self accountable for their own motivation and to be 100 percent every single game then don't get a manager you know get get a cleaner get someone who can you know <laughs> fan air on their faces but that's not that's not professional football and uh, it's the same it's not professional any sport and you need someone who can inspire you need someone who can lead and you need someone who can be relied upon to get the best out of people and that's how it works right it's almost like we want to bring pinto back to be the manager and just have him play edm music in the in, in the clubhouse he's too busy <laughs> i he's know he busy. is i know he is have you heard his song dan have I, you heard his song yes i have got somebody a, sent it to me yes you have it's a so, salta la comba tu, 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 tu. It's just weird. <laughs> so, but he's happy. But is that what Let the locker? Me. But is that what the locker room needs? Right? Is, a, is the locker room at this point? I mean, they're at the point that they're at in their careers with so many of them with Los Amigos. Do they just need somebody to try to rile them up and get them excited, or do they actually need somebody to to manage them? Because I mean, I think that's well, what that's what Valverde is supposed to be, right? He's supposed to just be a man, a man manager and not even a tactician, right? He's not a master tactician. He's not. He a lot of times we've said that he's been outmanaged in major games as he was in in you know no, numerous times already in his career. And surprisingly, against Levante, he gets outmanaged as well. But yeah, it's a confusing thing that if he's not a man manager at the moment, because he's really allowing these players to to dictate their playing time and dictate what happens on the field and he's not really a master tactician then it, it does leave you with the question of you know what really is Ernesto Valverde at the moment and again it's a I think it's a disservice to him as well because if Ernesto Valverde was Barca's manager during the Rijkaard era I think based on the players that the that the club had at the time now obviously a new generation was ushered in but I think Valverde with that squad in that time and that era of football winds up being a really great manager for Barca. It's this weird thing where I think we're going to timestamp this and say, what was Barca at this moment in 2019 and 2020 and 2018? And what was Valverde to that team? And that's a worrying thing to me that I think he just wound up being the wrong manager for the wrong era for Barca. And as we mentioned uh, time and time again, this is just an older team that this was the wrong manager to try to do. Uh, I mean, he was never going to do this youth movement as much as we believed it to be. It is this weird thing where we're starting the new year, we're starting 2020, and yet we're still waiting to close this chapter. Not on the older players, because I think Messi still has a few years left. Busquets has, as I mentioned, a few years left. Alba, uh, PK, and Suarez, I think, are closer to having one foot out the door. But all of that said, we're waiting for that youth movement. We're waiting until that next coach really does shake things up and has the courage and bravery to say, to certain of those uh, Los Amigos and go, uh, I mean, I'm not, Jordi Alba, I think, is the incumbent starter. Obviously, he's been leagues ahead of Junior Firpo, but let's say Jordi Alba, and I'm using him as an example because he's probably the least uh, other than Messi. He has his spot, uh, you know, quite safe in the squad for the next two or three years. But what happens when Alba completely falls out of form next season? Is Valverde is not, wouldn't be the manager to have the bravery to take him out of the lineup and tr even try something different. Uh, so who's going to be the manager that does that? And that's going to be next year's manager. So I think we are, it, it seems we're still on this treadmill, Frances, this season, and we're going to be on it throughout the rest of the year. So we're going to have to almost find new things to talk about, you know? Yeah, and, but the thing is, with all of that being said, Barca still have a chance to win every competition, you know, because mathematically we're in there. Um, we are definitely not spectacular in any way, shape or form. Like, I was watching the game against Espanol and honestly, I couldn't see much difference between one side and the other. Um, I, 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 Barca have become very, very average and they play in an average sort of mid-table and ambitious and attractive way. Fortunately, we've got Messi, we've got um, people like Suarez, people like Griezmann, people who can score goals here and there. It's just so, so boring. Um, if you think about where we were in 2009, we had an inspiring manager who had players coming through. We had a board that was prepared to invest very heavily, as I said at the start, very heavily on those players who were actually going to make a difference. They were also prepared to spend on sort of um, non-regular starters if need be, but there was a manager and there was a structure of people like, in terms of coaching structure throughout not just Barca first team, but throughout the whole of La Masia and obviously Barca B that were scouting, they're promoting, and they were sort of um, broadcasting and speaking to the right channels in order to get people promoted. Because do you think now, if Lionel Messi at 16 years old come through La Masia today, you think Valverde starts him like uh, say Van Hal and, and Reichard, um were doing? Obviously not Van Hal himself because that was through training. But he just doesn't get a look in. 
he just doesn't get a look in. And if you think about, say, obviously, don't want to compare them too much, but Ansu Fati, Ansu Fati's playing next to nothing. And when Messi was starting, um, he was starting to sort of uh, show his face in the first team. He wasn't starting every game, but because um, it was Ludovic Juli was starting at the time, but he had 30, 35, 25, 35, 40 minutes every single match. Mm-hmm. You know, Messi was featuring every week, and that's not happening. So if Messi was starting uh, from sort of from Barca B to the first team now, he would not be playing the way that he was playing, and his his uh, progress would have been stalled. Yeah. I agree with all that, uh, and I think that's a good place to leave it. Again, where we started the the season on uh, this new year, not on a negative note, but I think the te- when the team is on a negative note, I think we are too. And we're getting a draw against the bottom team in the Liga is certainly not going to lead to a positive show afterwards. But uh, Francesca, as I said, there's so many big things coming. I think hopefully for the team uh, in the new year, they're still alive in everything uh, and doing well in every competition. But in the same regard, I think there are also some huge things uh, for the podcast and the YouTube channel. I know for those who are paying attention to the YouTube channel, you haven't seen my face in a while. And that's because I mentioned that I I did move just down the road. But anyway, we're building something in the basement uh, of our new place and things are going to be looking good. And that'll be an exciting thing to see when you see my shining, smiling face again once on the YouTube channel. (laughs) You've got a beautiful face, Dan. Oh, thank you, Francis. So we're going to we're going to keep moving forward with that again. We also want to say we're really excited that we joined the Blue Wire Network for the new year uh, and that'll just help with uh, our, our ads as well. And so you're actually going to hear us on live ad reads as opposed to going back to the uh, we'll just say those big commercials that you've you've heard in the past. So that'll be an exciting thing as well. We're also still obviously on Patreon at tvpod.link backslash Patreon. That's where I do the quick take match review. So they're the people that have helped for the last three years make all this possible. So not only thank you to them to start 2020, but that's also where you can get additional content. I also do a Friday spot in the UK on Love Sport Radio. That's also and exclusively on the Patreon page unless you're hearing it live in the UK. Uh, and then finally, for we also have the can no with that, Dan. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, just to say there. Um, over the Christmas break, I actually got a chance to listen to that show um, uh, through the Patreon as well. And it was really, really good. It's a, it's a classical, isn't it? It's a, a classical show. And yes. uh, there is someone talking about Madrid who we don't really care about. And there was you um, by yourself. So I think that is very, it was like a, like a live interview. Like obviously you're the Barca expert. And it was really dynamic, and I really do think that um, our listeners would definitely enjoy that. Um, so that's accessible to our patron. Yep, as well as if you just want to be listening to this show for free and you want to just follow us on social media, that's the easiest thing you can do as well. We're on Twitter, at the Barcelona Pod at Hilton D13 for me, on Instagram, at the Barcelona Pod. Uh, and obviously, I've already plugged the YouTube channel. We've got some cool stuff that is up there if you missed it over the holiday break. Uh, at the end of last season, I did a La Masia, you know, basically rising stars, the best players from La Masia in 2019 last season, and that included Ansu Fadi, so I'm going to pat myself and pat Naveed on the back for that, as well as uh, Ricky Puj was featured in that piece, and now I had five new, well, four new names, and or five new names and one uh, repeat from that last list for January uh, that we just did for the first half of this season. That is up on the YouTube page, as well as what is the Spanish uh, Super Cup history that I already mentioned in this show and I have some transfer work and I obviously know uh, it can get clickbaity but as far as the potential transfers for FC Barcelona in the January window uh, it's a little bit of what we talked about but I'm working on something there so that'll be something that'll go up on the YouTube channel in the forthcoming weeks in January because again it is still the January transfer window so changes could be happening and by the time you have this in your ears there could be 90 new rumors the only thing that I care about Frances is that you and I are still doing this show and Lionel Messi is still at Barcelona at least until uh, the end of well for a while <laughs> yeah we don't know how long that will be for um, I guess it's a couple of years but uh, hopefully I'm wrong yep and so we're just hoping that uh, Barcelona are doing their due diligence in the transfer January transfer window uh, and everything winds up hoping to have a bright future so I think that'll wrap up this show thanks so much for listening as always and until next time we'll talk to you soon at Forza Barca Forza Forza